I ask if you would take your Bibles and turn to Romans 4. And hopefully you've taken advantage of the different links that we have on the website. Uh, on the home page, you have some um, handouts there regarding Romans chapter 3, verse 19, and you've got them for chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, which we will be working through uh, over the next few months. We're entering into Romans 4. And the whole, uh, real quick, I, I had somebody ask me, so where in the world are we going with all this? And, and maybe I haven't been clear. Um, our goal is to get to what constitutes the body of Christ and how is the body of Christ unique from any other age or any other dispensation uh, that has been uh, marked by God for his purposes? And the idea here is that if the church is known for anything, of course it's known for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's known for the preaching of the resurrection, it's known for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the manifestation of these things that happen don't just come from discernment in the word of God, by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, but it's also in the fact that we have been gifted with spiritual gifts that we are to exercise for the encouragement and benefit of one another. And so the question was, if we want to get to spiritual gifts and understand that and unpack that, how do we do that? And the only way that we can do that is by starting from the very beginning of what happened on God's side of salvation. What happens on our side is we hear the gospel we respond in belief to the gospel, and immediately at the moment of belief, the Holy Spirit indwells us and seals us for the day of redemption. And we have about 50 other things that take place in our lives uh, that God immediately does at the moment that we respond to the gospel. Our response to the gospel is by faith. Faith is what appropriates the righteousness of God to our stead that was won for us by Christ on the cross. Uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that faith has no work in it whatsoever, and we're going to see that today. Uh, but here's the thing is, and until we learn our foundational position in Christ, that all that we have is because of him, that we are fully accepted in him, that all blessings are going to flow from what we have in him, that we are secure, that we are established, that we are reconciled, that we are identified with him. Until we understand all of those things, which is what Romans 3, 4, and the beginning of 5 are going to explain to us, we cannot begin to grow and walk in the Spirit. It just won't happen. We will look at things in the Bible, or we'll look at other Christians and see what they are doing and are not doing, and we will try to mimic what they're doing and they're not doing based off of observation, not based off of Holy Spirit conviction. And that is a problem because that's when you lead into legalism in the church. If we are not secure in our salvation because of what Jesus Christ has done, we can never serve him in the spirit. And if we cannot serve him in the spirit, we cannot exercise spiritual gifts. What we think are spiritual gifts will actually become fleshly endeavors where we're seeking to please ourselves and God is never glorified in that. So we are setting a track record of what it is to live the Christ life or to say it more plainly, to have Christ living his life through us. And we have to start with the bare bones, basic foundation of our justification by faith and the nature that faith has to be alone. And so what I'm going to ask you to do uh, is, is to have your Romans 4 out, whether that be in your Bible or the paper that you've printed out. Uh, and, and let me read this real quick that I've written down just to kind of get us up to speed of what we're dealing with. I know that I threw a lot at you last week. I encourage you to go back and look at it again. I encourage you to go back and search the scriptures again. I'm, I'm trying to give you enough things on a Sunday that will keep you busy the other six days of the week of being refreshed and understanding of these things. And we have to understand how detrimental this idea of faith alone is. So God has declared us righteous. And he's declared us righteous, that's what the word justification means, by the death of Christ and the payment of his blood. And that is appropriated to us by faith alone. Nothing that we've done, it's all Christ's work, it's only by his blood. Justification is a death truth. It deals with the death of Jesus Christ. The resurrection does not come into this issue at all. It comes into it later. 
The question is, how is sin going to get taken care of as a problem? And Jesus Christ is the answer put forth by God in order to take care of the problem. So his blood deals with sins, the fact that we have committed offenses against God. Now, why is this important that it's by faith alone and all the work is on Christ? Because false systems of salvation or false systems of religion, whatever you want to call them, are first and foremost demonic. I make no apologies whatsoever for saying that they are instituted or oriented in demonic activity wholeheartedly, full and free. Uh, And here's the reason why, is because it originates with lesser gods than Yahweh, created celestial beings, but they are not the creator, and they are operating all of them on a personal merit system. Christianity is the only belief system in the world where the work is freely given forward by the grace of God, And that acceptance is full and free when one responds in faith. Every system besides that demands some sort of personal merit. And one of the greatest problems, uh, fractions that has introduced itself into the church is the fact that we have muddied the waters of grace alone and faith alone with demands upon people for performance and results that they are not able to manifest in a biblical manner because it's not being handled biblically from the beginning. And why is this important? Because you have to ask yourself that if someone has stepped into the situation or stepped into the conversation with some form of works in the mix, you have to question whether or not they're even really, truly justified by faith alone. And that gets scary. Why is that? Because the lake of fire is a reality. So, Since every lesser God demands a a personal merit system, a a grocery list that you have to equal up to or check into, only Yahweh provides a substitute. No one else has set forth a Savior. There is no other Savior that any other belief system ever has put forward. Any attempt to add work should be understood as completely contradictory to God's truth and antithetical to the redemption of Jesus Christ. So... With that being said, now let's look at Romans chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Paul continues his argument from before. And he starts with a question, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who does, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sin has been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Why does Paul, and therefore we, Keep going over the doctrine of justification by faith alone apart from works. Here's the reason why is because for the Christian, it's the most important doctrine in the Bible. Because as we've said before, you cannot grow if you do not know your position in the Lord Jesus. Some of you may be rolling your eyes, if not actually, maybe in your head saying, good grief, we've gone through this. Don't we have this by now? I will go ahead and tell you, no, you don't. You do not have this. You do not have this down. We need to be refreshed of this every day. The fact that we are fully accepted by God because of everything that Jesus has done. And there is no expectation on us whatsoever to try to earn favor with him. None. We are fully accepted. 
The introduction of works into the gospel is always an enemy of the gospel. And think about this, guys, please. Ponder on this seriously. If someone has introduced works into the gospel equation, something as simple as you need to do this, you have to do this, God expects you to do this. Well, if it if you're really saved, I should see this. And fill in those blanks for whatever you've heard in your past. I'm sure you've heard something. But if that is the case, you literally have to ask yourself the question, is that person even really saved? Because the addition of works is the enemy of the free grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this can be something uh, as blatant as, and I've got a list of things here, baptism, walking an aisle, joining a church, praying a certain prayer, praying in a certain direction, praying at a certain time of day, chanting a mantra, uh, participating in the elements of communion, promising not to sin anymore, at least to do better in the future, issuing a confession of sin to another person, holding to your denominational beliefs. Now, am I saying that non-denominational people don't have problems? Oh, they got problems. They do. We all got problems. But the fact of saying, well, this is what my denomination believes to be true, and you're not willing to search the scriptures for yourself to pull it together, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. How about holding to accepted traditions? How about agreeing with popular preachers? How about, well, if I just give money, that way I'll be accepted. Well, I'm obviously giving money. That means I must be a Christian. Well, I sat in Sunday school for for 12 years. I must be a Christian. Even helping others, as good as that is, doesn't make you saved. How about checking off a list of do's and don'ts? Well, I don't do this, but I do do this. And so therefore, to me, that's evidence that I am saved. But it could also be something as subtle as our personal feelings about being saved. How do I feel about my salvation on any given day? That is a dangerous place because it fluctuates. And until our minds and our hearts are rooted and grounded on the work of Christ and the fact that we're fully accepted by God because of Christ, we will not have assurance of salvation. You cannot move forward. So the only thing that stands true in all of this is God's word. And his word tells us that we are justified freely by his grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Nothing more, nothing less. I hope that we understand them. Now, why is it such a serious issue? Because it would be different if it was just cults and other churches and fringe beliefs and wackos or whatever you want to see that are working against you. Those are just what you can see. Uh, It's important for us to understand, and the Bible teaches this, it is replete in the scriptures, that there are unseen forces that are working tirelessly to pursue, to, 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 forgive me, to pollute the gospel of God's free grace into something that requires your submission or your ritual for acceptance. We have to be a people, if we believe the Bible, we have to be a people that understand that Satan is ruthless and he is crafty, that sin is serious, that the lake of fire is a reality for the unsaved, and that demons want nothing more than to destroy God's creatures to a damnable end. So this is why we reiterate the gospel of God's free grace by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and any other gospel that anyone would say to agree with Paul in Galatians chapter 1 is a perversion. They should be anathema. They should be accursed because of that. If you notice in Romans chapter 4 verse 1, we have an introduction of a personality that Paul wants to put forward as an example. And this is the person of Abraham. Now, if you notice what it says there, Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. I'm going to talk more about this next week. But there are some people that would look at a phrase like that and they would equate the fact that the church is actually an extension of what God was doing with Israel and that God has done away with Israel uh, from the Old Testament and is now working with the church and the church is the new Israel. That is completely false because Abraham is not Israel. Uh, Again, we will deal with that later. However, he is our forefather, according to the flesh, because he is our forefather, according to faith. And we are going to see that today. In order for us to reiterate the demonic uh, um, force that is against the idea of a full and free salvation being paid for for us, I want to take you to some things to show you about Abraham and why he is an example. If you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. We learned something pretty amazing about Abraham and his lineage here. 
These are things for you to jot down and, and just to think of and to pay attention to. Because this is what makes the example that Paul wants to use of Abraham that much more pertinent to what we're discussing about faith alone. In chapter 24 of Joshua, let's start in verse 1. It says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and he called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, and their judges, and their officers, and they presented them before Elohim. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, that's the Euphrates River. So he's giving us a geographical location. Namely, Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, now watch this and mark it, and they served other gods. In fact, the god, little g god that was prominent in that region, which is known as Ur of the Chaldeans, was a god known as S-I-N, Sin, was his name. And he is known as the moon god. He's also known in some literature as Nana, N-A-N-A. And he's actually known as the God of the Moon. So this is what they worshipped in that time. Now, just so that you understand geographically where we're talking about, we're talking about north of the Persian Gulf and what was also known as Babylon, which today we understand as Iraq. So all of this has a connection together, and I guarantee you, whether knowingly or unknowingly, the people there still worship the moon god, Sin. It says here, verse 3, Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and led him through all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac to the land that he would show him. Now because of that understanding that that, that Abraham was pulled from the nations... Why is that important? Well, if you remember what we talked about last week with the Tower of Babel, and how did we get all of these different nations? We got them from a dividing of their languages. Because when they tried to build a tower that would reach to the heavens and to make a name for themselves because they had rejected God as being king over them, he divided them up and he gave each nation an allotment for one of the sons of God in order to rule over them, little g God, as little g gods, over every province and person. And I gave you a whole host of, uh, of references that you could check out last week in order to understand that. Notice that what God does here, which is unique in this situation, and if we were studying our dispensations, we would see when we come to the dispensation of promise, it's very interesting that God is working with the whole world up until this point, and then he pulls back from the whole world, and he works with one individual, and he pulls Abraham from the nation. So where he had cast all of these people and dividing their languages, he pulls one person from there as they were ruled over other gods, and he says, I am going to be your God. And what makes this a unique situation is that all the other gods over the nations are created beings. Only Yahweh is the uncreated, uncaused cause who is the creator of all things. And so it makes for a unique relationship because God is going to prove a point through the lineage of Abraham. Now, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 11. Genesis chapter 11. We're going to look at the end of 11 and the beginning of 12. We've gone over this a few times here, but the Abrahamic covenant is absolutely important for us to understand because it sets the stage for what will prophetically happen in the end times. There are promises that God has made and they will be fulfilled. Let's start in verse 27 of chapter 11 of Genesis. Now, these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, of course, that later becomes Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, that's where they came from, Babylon, Iraq. That's how we would understand that. It says here, Verse 29, Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And the daughters of Haran, 
sorry, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Verse 30, Sarah was barren. She had no child. Verse 31, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran, which is the northern tip of that area, if you were to get out one of your maps in your Bible, and settled there. So notice the call to leave Ur of the Chaldeans was obeyed in verse 31. But the problem is, is there's a lot of people going. Abram was not supposed to be taking his dad with him. Verse 32, the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. So Abram's dad passes away. And in chapter 12, verse 1, you have something new moving forward. Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Mark land. And I will make you a great nation. And if you want to mark next to that, seed is the idea. Abraham is going to have a plentiful offspring. So these are promises that God is making to him. And I will bless you. God is going to bless Abram and make your name great. He's going to have a name of renown. That would probably be one of the many reasons why he's brought up here in Romans 4.1. And so you shall be a blessing. In other words... Even though these nations have been cast away because of their unbelief and rebellion against the one true God, God is still going to bless all of the nations of the world through Abram and his descendants. Blessing for the nations comes through Israel, and especially is based on and contingent upon their treatment of Israel. Verse 3. And I will bless those who bless you. This is a divine promise. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In other words, there is worldwide blessing that will spring out of Abraham. Now, this is an incredible amount of promises that have been made here. But the reason why is because the history of Abraham details his calling to a land which actually is Yahweh's inheritance. Yahweh will be their God, their Elohim. Now with that in mind, we have land, seed, and blessing. Seed has come to fruition by many Jews that have come out of this situation from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the 12 sons of Jacob and so on and so forth to what we see today with the millions. The blessing that has come through has been the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ, through Abraham's seed. But now we have this issue of the land. And after a little while, a promise gets old if it's not fulfilled. So there ends up being a lot of doubt. We easily run out of patience. Maybe you're experiencing that right now in quarantine. I thought we were going to be done on this day. And you start to run out of patience, and you start to question, and you start to doubt a lot. Turn with me over a couple of chapters to Genesis 15, because this is exactly what happens with Abram. He starts putting two and two together. He's not for sure how things are going to happen. He starts to get concerned. And so the Lord needs to refocus him, reestablish him, encourage him. Chapter 15, verse 1, After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And it's interesting because Abram changes his address, not just to Yahweh, but he now invokes the Lord's name for Master or Lord. Verse 2, Abram said, O Adonai, Yahweh, Lord, self-existent one, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Now think about the problem this creates. This is not just the problem of descendants 
and the seed that is to be entailed, but it's also the idea is if worldwide blessing is to come through Abraham, he's just one guy. So how is it going to come about if there are no children in play? Verse 4, Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir. But one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Now watch this, because Yahweh wants to show him a very clear illustration. And he took him outside, and he said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now before we move forward in looking at this, Imagine that God makes a promise. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. You're watching this scene take place. And God brings Abraham out to look up at the night sky. And as far as you can see, top to bottom, east to west, doesn't matter where you look. Stars, constellation, the, the, the beauty of the night sky is before you. And God encourages you not to belittle you, not to demean you, but to try to count them. And immediately you think in your mind, well, this is just unbelievable. It's innumerable. There's no way that I could possibly even begin. I would lose my place once I got about 12 in. There's no way I'd be able to do this. And Yahweh wants to reiterate the depth of his blessing by saying, so shall your descendants be. You are going to have as many kids as the stars. That's how incredible this promise is going to be when I choose to fulfill it. Don't lose hope, Abraham. Now, Notice that the issue is, is, Lord, I don't have any children, and I know children come from you, and, and essentially what I'm saying is, is I think you're withholding children from me, and I don't see how this is going to work. God's response is one of mercy, and he demonstrates that actually I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all you could have ever asked or thought that I could do. So notice Abram's response, verse 6, and it's so important that you grasp this verse because of how much it's used in the New Testament. Then he believed in the Lord, in Yahweh. And understand this, guys. Belief means nothing more than convinced that what God told him was absolutely true. He had a conviction about this. He says here, then he believed in Yahweh and he reckoned, pay attention to that word, uh, he assigned value to it. He considered it to be true. He was credited with this idea. Uh, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham believed, he responded to what God said to him in faith. And because he responded in faith, he's immediately reckoned or credited with righteousness. Understand that the template set forward in the Old Testament is very plain. It's very clear. Abraham did nothing to earn righteousness. In fact, if anything, he brought doubt to the table and needed God's reassurance. And thank the Lord that he is a loving father who is patient with his people, and chooses to show him that. So notice verse 7, and he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Now remember, that would have had implications of worshiping other gods. And notice that Yahweh is setting himself apart as completely unique in Abram's life. Notice what he says, out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to possess it. In other words, I am going to fulfill these promises through you. So what do we learn here? Well, in relation to this contract, this agreement, this covenant with Abraham, the whole idea is that justification has always, always been by faith alone. It's not different from Old Testament to New Testament. Now, with that in mind, and because we've hammered this, and I'm asking you not to let it get stale in your mind, let's go back to Romans 4, 1. And now that we understand why Abraham would have been put forward as an example, who was taken out from the nations, who are ruled by unrighteous deities that are created beings, and set aside unto the Creator Himself with great and wonderful promises that have been put forward, that righteousness was no different for Abraham than it is for us. 
So chapter 4, verse 1, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? What has he obtained? What has he procured? And notice the causal conjunction. Here we connect it in verse 2 to give an explanation. If Abraham was justified by works. Now, if you have your paper or if you can squeeze it in between your lines in your Bible, above works, you might want to write the word doing, D-O-I-N-G. There's a contingency in play. If Abraham was justified by works, by doing something, he has something to boast about. And that Greek word used there actually is the idea of having a grounds of boasting, that you can stand firmly upon it and you can throw your fist up in the air and you can go, ha ha, I did it. It's me. I put these things together and it accomplished a righteous declaration in God's sight. You could brag about that. You could glory in that, but not before God. Now we might say, why in the world does it tack that on? Because verse three follows it up with a four. Here's the reason why you can't brag about that before God. You may think that you have something to boast about by your works. Verse three, four, what does the scripture say? Notice that. Go back to God's word. What do we know about Abraham? And we reiterate again, Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Notice that even in the Old Testament, and reiterated again in the New Testament, belief is the only condition. What has God said? Do you believe it? Notice it's not about doing, it's about being. It's about being in belief of what God has said. you either convinced it's true or it's not. Now watch this. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, notice that nothing about Abraham's reputation or person is considered here. God doesn't say, well, you seem to be a big doubter about anything I've said to you, so why in the world am I going to help you out? No, he simply gives him an illustration of how he's going to fulfill one of the promises that he gave to him, and Abraham responds with, I believe that. Now he's accredited with righteousness. Now, If you look at this word credited, we saw this previously in chapter 3, verse 28 last week. It is the word logizomai. And it's important that we understand this because it is used a lot between verses 3 and verses 12. And we're not going to get as far as verse 12 today, but logizomai is the idea of reckoning or crediting or considering something to be true. And here's something that you need to know about this in chapter 4. This idea of crediting or reckoning is always that God does the reckoning in the chapter. We are not asked to reckon or consider anything until Romans 6. And this entire time, it is always how God sees us, how God concerns himself with us, or how God's view of us, or what he sees when he looks upon us. So if you think of it that way, Abraham believed God, he responds in faith to what God said, and it, his belief, was credited, reckoned by God to him as righteousness. It's the idea that he now is in right standing as far as God is concerned. Does this mean that Abraham doesn't sin? No, not at all. He's still going to do all kinds of silly things if you were to read the Genesis narrative on. But as far as his standing before the creator of all things, he is righteous. Now here's two scenarios that are put forward in this idea. Verse 4. And if you want, next to verse 4, maybe uh, above uh, where it says, now to the one, you might want to write a number one there. And in, and in verse 5, we'll write a number 2 where it says, but to the one. That's, that's number 2, guys. So number 1, guy, we're going to deal with here in verse 4. Now, to the one who does. Now, now, remember, that's the doing person from verse 2. To the one who does, the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but as what is due. Now, let's break this down word-wise so that you understand this. I actually wish that the New American Standard did a little bit better making this more plain. I don't understand some of the choices that were made here for words. But notice, now to the one who works, the one who produces, the one who's productive, the one who is putting forth energy. You're actively involved, okay? Notice what it says here. His wage, and this word is important, this is the word misthos, And it's used heavily in relation to eternal rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But what this means is a renumeration of work done or a recompense. It's pay that you get. 
Uh, you, you work, you get a pay for that is the idea, the, the, the agreed amount there. It's a paying back for, for work done. His wage is not credited, logizomai, reckoned, as a favor. Now, here's where I have the issue. Circle the word favor. Because the word favor here is haris, grace. It's grace. This word should be translated grace. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as grace but as what is due, what is owed, the debt that's been incurred, the wages for the work done is the idea there. What is that telling you? It's telling you that grace and works are mutually exclusive. It's the oil and water of the scriptures. You cannot mix grace and works. If it's works, it's not of grace. If you want to write in next to there Romans eleven six to give you that principle, it spells it plain, plainly there. But if this word favor were translated grace, I feel like it would have uh, the right delineation between these two things that Paul's trying to explain. If you work, you have a wage, and that wage is not reckoned to you as grace. No one gets a paycheck and turns around to their boss and says, you are so generous for giving me these funds. This is so amazing that I've got this dollar amount. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for that. You may be appreciative of having the job, but you worked the hours and that's why you get the return. You put in the work and you get the wage back. That's why we're told the wages of sin is death. What we've put into life and existence is sin. What we get back as a payment is death. That's all we do. We can't do anything other. In this situation, notice if you work it forward, it's not grace. It's not gratitude. It's not generosity. It's not thanks. It's not favor. It's not any of those things whatsoever. It's what you're owed. And so therefore we take that paycheck and we say, give me my money. And we go to the bank and we put it into the bank and we say, thank you, me. The only person that gets the boasting there is me. Why? I did the work. I'm getting the return. Now let's go to, to person number two in verse five. But, and notice, but here's our 180 degree shift in another direction to the one who does not work, no energy, no production, nothing to show for it, nothing to brag about, no grounds for boasting, nothing. Look, but believes again, the only condition, just like we saw in verse three, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. Now, here's what's great. The ungodly, that's you and me. That's me, that's Mitch, that's Emily, that's certainly Tom. That's all of us. That's all of us. We are the ungodly. Here we are in Scripture. The ungodly, the ones who only have bad works, the ones who only do wrong, the ones who would much rather take an amount of money than to come to God through His free means of faith that the Spirit wouldn't have convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and if we wouldn't have heard the gospel, there's no way we would have had any reason to respond to God's good news whatsoever. So if that's the case, we are an ungodly people apart from God's intervention of the Word and the Spirit. He says that you cannot do anything to come to Him properly. So the one who does not work, his wage, or I'm sorry, the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, watch this, his faith is logizomai, reckoned, credited, uh, considered as righteousness. No works, none. Now, verse 6, let's give an example here. And this is what we saw in Psalm 32. Just as David also speaks of the blessing, please mark it. Because the idea of blessing here is how fortunate or privileged or favored or happy one is because of a certain set of circumstances. And we find ourselves in a happy circumstance because there are no works that we could bring. Isn't that how the song goes? Of no works that I bring, only to your cross I cling. That's the idea. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God logizomize righteousness, here it is, apart from works. You are blessed if you've set down your works and you've come to God simply believing what he has told you. Simply believing in what he's put forward as the gospel because 
Jesus Christ has done all the work. So here it is. This is our position of standing in God's sight. Blessed, there it is again, mark it. It's used four times here. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. There's the ungodliness in us, our lawless deeds. Or if we sit down and want to keep a running track record of everything that we've done, it's all wrong. Have you even noticed that the whole suggestion of why we help other people is because it makes us feel good? There's no God in that. That's us scratching our own back so we can turn around and applaud our own selves. Think about that. Even the deep-seated motives, regardless of how genuine we seek to be, often end up being about self. And that's because this world system has trained us like a bunch of mindless monkeys. Notice in this situation, we are blessed because our lawless deeds have been forgiven. And get this word forgiven, please, guys. Our lawless deeds have been dismissed, let go, sent away as confessing sin on the head of the scapegoat and sending it out in the wilderness. It's been canceled. It's been pardoned. It's gone. Why are we blessed? Because everything we've done counts against us, and God doesn't count it at all. Notice in whose sin has been covered. And this Greek word, apikalupto, is the idea of to hide by covering, but it's also the idea of putting out of sight. It is used synonymously for forgiveness throughout the New Testament. So notice it's the idea of sin being absent. In verse 8, blessed, here it is again for the third time. The fourth one comes in verse 9. We're not going to get there today. But notice, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into logizomai. He won't reckon it to us. He doesn't consider it in our stead. We are not credited with it any longer. See, this is the great thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we find is that everything that we have to bring to this situation is the very things that we've always needed to be saved from. And there's nothing that God looks favorably upon whatsoever. Instead, salvation has always been by justification, by faith alone. It's simply believing what God has said. And what we find out is, is that we are in a happy, considerate, uh, favored, privileged, beautiful, fortunate position because all charges have been cleared because of the death of Christ. And what Paul is saying here is don't begin to bring works into this situation. It will render you not justified. You can not be justified because if it is of works, it has no business in grace. And we have no business in the works category because we only incur debt. We want to be in the grace category because that is the one that is bursting forward with full payment. I hope you recognize this, that verses 7 and 8 are our liberation. Setting us free. No more consideration in our stead of any sin whatsoever. Right now, in the eyes of God, you are sinless because he sees you in Jesus Christ. This is a position that we have to grasp. You say, good grief, why do you keep hammering this over and over and you keep going over this over and over? The reason why I do is I don't know about you, but I need it every day. Well, I'm tired of talking about it. Well, when did you get out of fellowship with the Lord? That's what I want to know. Because this is a truth that we cannot afford to get stale on. We cannot afford to get loose on. This is our hope. All that Christ has done in dying for us. Notice verse 7, we've been forgiven. Notice the second part of verse 7, our sins are covered. Notice in verse 8, he does not take them into account. In other words... The righteousness by faith that is present in our lives means that there is an absence of guilt due to sin. George Meisinger writes, God imputes righteousness to believers, not workers. You say, well, I'm not working for it. I'm I'm just believing. Are you? 
There's nothing that you've done recently to try to gain acceptance with God that he would favor you more. There's nothing that you've put forward hoping to catch God's eye and attention so that he would accept you. Have you come to terms with the fact that you are fully accepted in Christ? Because if you have, and if we understand verses 7 and 8 correctly, we meditate upon them, we all of a sudden recognize that assurance springs out of these verses. Assurance springs out of God's forgiveness by grace, not because of our works to maintain his favor, to try to earn his grace. He just freely gives. He freely gives because he is a giving God. He understands our frame. He knows that we are but dust. We can't do anything to help ourselves. Let's not try. Let's stop trying. Essentially, that's what we're seeing here. Don't try. If you try, you'll get back exactly what you've earned in this situation, and that's the lake of fire. Stop trying and believe. I found a wonderful quote from Watchman Nee. I encourage you, read Watchman Nee. You may not agree with everything he says. This man loved the Lord. He spent 20 years in a Chinese prison and died in prison for the gospel. But I encourage you to check out this quote. He says, I approach God through his merit alone and never on the basis of my attainment. Never, for example, on the ground that I've been extra kind or patient today or that I've done something for the Lord this morning. I have come by way of the blood every time. Is that how you've come to Christ? By the work of Christ put forward on the cross, by the death truth of his blood. If that's the case and you recognize that lawless deeds are forgiven, sins have been covered, that he doesn't logizomai, sin towards us, he doesn't credit us with those things, then blessing stands over you. Why? Because you are forgiven and you are liberated from the trappings of this world, from the other systems that these little G gods have set up to look for your merit and how well you are doing and are you performing. Guys, that's tiresome. We can never do enough to please people. The amazing thing about the creator God of all things is he never expected us to. Instead, he put forward his son to do it all for us. Praise be his name. And praise be his name that we come to him by the blood alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone because of your grace alone by itself. Works have no play. There is nothing we will ever do, can do, can think, can formulate, phrase in a certain way, dress a certain way, look a certain way, respond a certain way that will ever be deemed as acceptable in your sight. And this is why Jesus is not interested in living our lives. He's interested in living his life through us. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for his death. Thank you that he hung on the cross. Thank you that he's liberated us from all guilt and shame and the penalty of sin. We praise your holy name. It's awesome. It's awesome. And I pray that if for some reason this isn't sparking us to think about the goodness of your favor towards us, Lord, shake our heads. Get our marbles rolling again. Ignite our hearts. We need to be on fire for you, especially in this time when we have everything working against us to keep us silent, to keep us shut up, to keep us away from others, to keep us distant. Father, we have a message of life to share, the forgiveness of sins, how beautiful it is. Praise Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Amen.